Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Online Warriors podcast. We're still here, we're still going, and we're going to go as long as you'll let us go. I am Illegal86, and I am, as always, joined by my good friend, Nerd Bomber. Hello, hello, everybody. And her trusty compatriot, and mine, Tactic. Hey, how's it going? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good. We're, uh, we're closing in on the end of February. February, in my mind, is the worst month. And I say that knowing full well that Valentine's Day is the month of February. What what quick poll of the of the recording team? What is the worst month of the year, and why is it February? I agree that it's February. All of the good holidays are pretty much over. Like I'm talking end of February. The beginning of February is fine, but right. that last half just kind of drags on, and there's nothing like to look forward to. Yeah, and it's still cold and dark, and it's not fun. I don't like it. Yeah, I'm just gonna sit and jump on the bandwagon because all of your points are totally valid. I. Could- just concur with everything yeah i mean winter is over it's it's the last leg of winter when you're the most sick of winter you're we're approaching the daylight savings that everyone hates because it's the one where you lose an hour although that's in march but oh i forgot I that was coming up no yeah that's happening then you that's, get an extra hour of daylight i mean that's fair. i know you're I, I know you're right but that sunday is going to be the, it's going to be the worst i can already feel it and in that's the daylight uh, i won't pick up my phone oh gosh that is, is that a song? throwback. Because what in the daylight, everything feels like home. I think it, it, the song is actually called Daylight by Matt and Kim. I was going to say, I still don't know, but that was a nice Easter egg for the, for the people, for the folks out there. Anyways, February is almost over. That's my point. And for the last episode of February, we have a great schedule lined up for you. A great slate of topics. We're going to be talking about some spec updates on the Xbox Series X, which I still think does not have a great title, but we'll get to that. We're going to be talking about Star Wars, although that's going to be the later half of the episode. Why can't I remember what the second topic is? Uh, we're going to be talking about the Iger. Xbox Bob Iger, that's it. We're going to be talking about Bob Iger, who it just broke today, actually, that he's stepping down as CEO of Disney and instead becoming like chief executive or something. It's very confusing. We'll talk about it. Uh, yeah. So let's let's dive right in and let's talk about the Xbox Series X, the next big, well, it's one of the big next gen consoles that's slated to come out later this year. Today, I, I guess we heard a number of things about what it's going to be outfitted with. I don't know. You want to run down the list here, Nerd Bomber? Yeah, so I'm pulling this kind of summary off of The Verge. So Microsoft revealed more specs about the console. It'll be coming out later this year. Talking about teraflops, which is a big buzzword whenever consoles do come out, the Xbox Series X will have 12 teraflops of GPU performance, which is eight times more than the original Xbox One, which also will lend itself to ray tracing and enhanced graphical performance. It's also going to be outfitted with a custom AMD CPU to help support that 8K graphics capacity, and it will run everything at 120 frames per second. It also will have an NVMe, which I'm not sure what that stands for, a solid state drive, which will be replacing the standard hard drive that's in most of our consoles these days, and that will provide for quick startup and resume time. And something new that they announced in this teleconference announcement was that it will support quick resume of multiple games from suspended state, which will make switching between games that you're playing super fast and super easy and efficient. They'll also have reduced controller and HDMI latency, which I personally don't really have a problem with latency issues. But I guess as we're getting more into the realm of people playing with PC players, latency with the controllers is a big issue. And they also did confirm full backwards compatibility and quote unquote smart delivery So what that basically means is if you buy a game on the Xbox One, then you'll be able to transfer that game to the Xbox Series X. And not only will that be available with all of your first party titles, but it will be made available to third party titles. And the first one that was announced for that was Cyberpunk. So if you bought it on Xbox One, you'll be able to have a free upgrade, so to speak, when you get the Xbox Series X. Yeah, which is a pretty pretty sweet thing. I want to pick out one of the many numbers and specs that you just mentioned. And this is perhaps a very inane question. Uh, I might ask this question. A lot of the gamer fans out there might be like, what do you, you, you don't know? Uh, you mentioned that it's going to have 120 FPS. Mm-hmm. If, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, can't our eyes not see more than like 60? Or is that a, an old wives tale? I'm not 100% sure. So you're thinking about the refresh rate. You're thinking 60 hertz. I'm thinking of the hertz. Yeah. 
which is one over seconds. So, so we will see the visual improvement. I think it'll just make games look a lot more smoother and probably realistic. It'll be like things happening in real time instead of like an obvious game. I don't know if you've seen, like, have you played a game recently? And I I don't look at these either. So it's very difficult to know the difference unless you're actually actively looking for it. But if you do play like an older game that has 30 FPS and then you boot up something with 60 FPS, they definitely do look smoother, the newer ones. It's just like chonkier when you have 30 frames per second. Well, I would be curious to see like my point of reference for this is uh i mentioned probably a few episodes ago now that i was playing control on ps4 and i think i don't have a ps4 pro or anything but i just have a ps4 but there are times when you're playing control and if you are like throwing certain explosive things or like certain things happen it's like three frames per second it's like super super low so given all of the uh kind of crazy hardware specs you just threw at us i wonder how it could handle a game like that like i wonder what if there's a currently a game that could bring this sort of machine to its knees. I, I feel know. like the 120 FPS, even if games don't utilize it, I think it pretty much just guarantees that it'll at least be able to support a steady 60 frames per second. Like you said, like control right. had frame drops and hopefully then this console will be able to power through that and that won't happen. So what I'm most interested to see about all of these specs that were released was this confirmed the leaked specs that we had already heard about in the past and the same source had leaked the teraflops that the next PlayStation will have. And if this confirms those original leaked ones, well then, does that mean that the PlayStation specs are probably going to be pretty darn accurate? Yeah, I want to say that leak had had the PlayStation coming in at like nine teraflops, which... I was going to ask if you knew what the number was. It's mind-boggling to me. Like, I think the current... Huge difference. I think the current PlayStation for like base model or the slim or whatever the base model is now and the xbox one s i think those clock in at like six so i can't even imagine like games run relatively smoothly for me i don't really have that many issues right yeah the the xbox one x i actually i have a different article open in front of me from cnet and it says the series uh the series x will have 12 teraflops you mentioned which is double what the xbox one x could do um so yeah it, it it I will say, and as much as I just complained about control, I feel like if I had a PS4 Pro, everything would probably be fine. And like, I don't know how much processing power we need. Like, like, I maybe I'm hearing these numbers and I'm just thinking, wow, this is great because they're higher. D- how much do I actually need them to be higher to enhance my end user experience? Now, the things you mentioned about smart delivery and and this game upgrade system uh, that Cyberpunk is going to uh, kind of pioneer is super, super cool. The backwards compatibility is super important. I can understand uh, much more tangibly how important the controller latency would be. Like you said, uh, things like esports are turning into a very big deal. And I don't know, I've seen pro gamers complain about latency, like, and I can understand what it would feel like to have a controller that's slower. But I don't know, the 12 teraflops, it's hard for me to grasp. <laughs> um And similarly, the 120 FPS, like you said, maybe it's just kind of like a factor of safety for always making sure we at least get 60. So I can definitely get behind going faster simply because, so I've been playing Dragon Ball Z Kakarot on the Xbox One, and the thing that is killing me with this game, and I I always just start scrolling on my phone, is the load times between maps. And in this game, you're hunting for Dragon Balls, you're constantly jumping between maps, and so you're just sitting there loading and scrolling on your phone, waiting impatiently. Right, but that's more of an SSD thing, right? Because the SSD is also a huge deal. Well, yeah, but the the overall processing speed is going to take part in that. And I just, I'm overloading times. And I think this still to go faster is going to help with that. And I think that's important for at least my interest. Yeah, I mean, I think I would generally agree that if I were to pick any of the last like four or five games that I've played on the PlayStation 4, even ranging back to like Bioshock 1, which was remastered, but still it's Bioshock 1. It came out in like 2007. Like my biggest complaint with any of them probably had nothing to do with graphics it probably had things to do with like you said slow load times where it's for story driven games like i tend to play and i like i know nerd bomber tends to play that can really break your immersion right even if the load screens are are carefully crafted they're they're load screens absolutely like this spider-man load screen was a lot of fun like spider-man on the subway just chatting with people was super entertaining but only like the first 10 15 times and then it was the same thing and you were just sitting there like okay now i'm on my phone again yes i mean i would opt i I think i watched the that's the fast travel 
like load screen and i think i watched it two or three times and then i was like i don't even want to fast travel like i won't fast travel i'll just swing around because that's like i mean that game was so great that that alone was very fun yeah i literally and, fast traveled one time yeah exclusively. i think they make you I, if i remember correctly they that make was the you one do time once. right yeah to know to know like oh you can do this so go ahead and try it but then after that i was like i just like swinging so much and granted you know uh, we saw with the playstation demo for the playstation 5 which was way back they were showing how the solid state drive could really really amp up like how fast they loaded that city which was like this super complex environment it, you know it was mapped out exactly like manhattan and it was huge um and they showed how much the solid state drive could could benefit that and i'm sure like you said the processing power would feed into that i guess i just more associate it with the solid state drive and i do agree that i think that's probably the single biggest deal for me in terms of like getting an improved gaming experience has nothing to do with graphics better graphics are good but we have to be approaching a plateau there right and this is something that we've also talked about before well i think not only are we reaching that like realistic plateau but you're starting to get into like uncanny valley territory where i don't know if i want to be controlling a super lifelike person like one of the things and i obviously didn't play death stranding yet and i'm not sure i ever will but one of the things that kind of threw me off was that norman Reedus looked way too lifelike and even like the baby and it added this creepy factor and i know the game was supposed to have a little bit of a creepy vibe but that totally turned me off of it i don't know what it was about it but it was just like oh this is too realistic i don't like it so if you yeah. get too realistic at a certain point, then I don't know. I feel like people might get creeped out. Using uh, real actors for video games is like, it's a very perilous choice, I think. Because like, even in Until Dawn, which I think we talked about that on the podcast. I know Nerd Bomber, I think you tried to play it and you gave up because it was too scary. It contributed to the creepy factor there too, but that was a horror game. And it was supposed to be creepy. Right, right. But, but my yeah, my point being that like Rami Malek is in that game hayden penitentiary is in that game and like you see them and especially in a game that contains a lot of other like nobody actors or like just nobody characters it's it's jarring and especially when they look so close but not quite right you know it's so I, yeah i think i think i i agree with you about the uncanny valley thing and maybe we're approaching that level of photorealism i don't know in any case xbox series x come in still no update on the release date yet as far as i know it's just holiday 2020 yeah so. and I, I think with delays and stuff we, it might push out till a little bit later so who knows we still haven't heard anything from sony either about the playstation aren't they aren't they saving it for state of play or do we not know that i am not sure it would i know a, they were supposed to potentially reveal things at gdc but they pulled out lol it would be a huge huge bummer if these didn't come out for the holiday season because of course they're getting so much hype and they're being built up over years of time and they've been targeting holiday 2020 for quite a while if i understand correctly so that would suck if you had to pick one right now what would it be xbox of the two yeah i think i would lean into xbox i have game pass locked in until 2021 and i also have a lot of faith in the fact that xbox has to bounce back from last generation and the lack of first party titles and they bought so many different studios that and the console just seems like it'll be more powerful from what rumors we've heard but right. at the end of the day like you know me i'll probably buy both i do know you yes <laughs> and yeah that does seem like the kind of thing that you guys i mean you have two, it's a two gamer household so that's like a pretty good excuse to do it i'm in my household i'm pretty much just one guy so i feel like if you buy two consoles in that scenario it's like a little bit more like what are you doing i don't know i mean i'm undecided I, I probably won't buy either of these for quite a while i've mentioned publicly i think on this show that i'll probably buy a nintendo switch before i buy either of the next gen consoles that are coming gun to my head i would probably pick the playstation just because i currently own a playstation 4 and i'm very happy with it and just to clarify what you said in our bummer are you willing to go on record and say that microsoft lost the last generation oh yeah i've never argued that they they really have yeah. i think game pass was brilliant i think that was their kind of their saving grace but i think them trying to shoehorn in the connect at launch and trying to make it a tv type console which didn't go buffy. over well that wasn't a super smooth sailing and then they just didn't have a lot of first party titles the ones they did have were great but they just didn't have a lot of them so right well hopefully holiday 2020 for the xbox series x and the ps5 let's talk about disney for i don't know probably the 50th or 60th time on this podcast but hey it's disney they're in everything right bob Iger. a lot of you guys probably know the name bob Iger. you might not know exactly why I, I think if I unprompted heard the name Bob Iger, I'd be like, he's the CEO of something, but I don't remember what. He was, until today, 
the Disney CEO. Disney announced Tuesday that Bob Iger will step down from the role and become executive chairman through 2021, effective immediately. And another Bob, Bob, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, Bob Chap- Chap- Chapek, yeah, that's what I'm guessing, will assume the role of CEO, who, and Bob Chapek most recently served as the chairman of the Disney Parks, Experiences, and Products, which I guess is everything but like the movies. I don't understand exactly. Iger is essentially going to be staying on as executive chairman to kind of um, assist in the transition and continue to focus on Disney's creative strategy. So a couple of things here. What is the difference between CEO and executive chairman? Because they both have the word executive in them. I guess one is the chief and one is the chairman. I think the chairman is, is is more on like the board of directors and doesn't totally oversee the day to day. They're just someone that the CEO reports to at the end of the day. Um, I do know the reasoning he said was that he wanted to have more of a role in the creative side of things in Disney. So I wonder if it's like stepping back from stuff like financials and actual operations and then just getting to like tinker and have fun. Because I think he's been with Disney as a CEO for at least 15 years, if not more. I wanted to remember like 15 years ago, him being like inducted and taking over the role. He took over in, in October of 2005. I actually have it right in front of me because i have a little graph of disney's stock performance under bob Iger. which if you're a stock person uh it fell two and a half percent today because of this announcement presumably it's worth noting that in general the stock went up obviously while Iger was chairman but that's a different matter that's because of disney plus it does oh, seem so, like a really interesting time for him to leave and super out of the blue because it feels like disney is rolling like it has never before like it's always been successful but you think about their portfolio of properties and like the launch of disney plus and the fact that what last year they had seven billion dollar movies like geez right well so reportedly on a call with investors and i'm quoting directly from a cnpc article now uh, on a call with investors shortly after the announcement Iger addressed the timing of the announcement which happened 22 months before he was expected to retire at the end of 2021 i'm not sure why he was expected to retire then but that's besides the point Iger said he decided to step down now because he wanted to focus on the creative side as he said now that major projects like the fox merger and the launch of disney plus were behind him so what i read there is that he was tearing his hair out trying to get this disney plus thing to go and now that it went he's like all right i want to do fun stuff (laughs) and now he's moving on i mean as far as like higher up jobs in disney goes uh, running the fox merger is is one of the drier ones right like it doesn't sound doesn't sound fun at all to me yeah i feel like there's got to be so much just paperwork and meetings and that can't be fun because really haggling like i understand that you're working for disney but at the end of the day like it's just business meetings that's not fun at all and from what we've seen kind of in the news fox pro- seems kind of stubborn to with a lot of things to work with so it was probably a lot of heated debate back and forth well, I mean, imagine being a company, let alone a company fighting like Fox, Disney. Yeah, fighting Di- Yeah, fighting Disney, and like being the umpteenth company that Disney has come to and said, "Yeah, we want to buy you and make you a part of the largest, you know, media conglomerate in the world now." And it would be hard to not want to fight it tooth and nail, even if they were offering you the world. I mean, I, I, from a Disney, from the Disney side, if you're an executive involved in that merger. I guess it could be fun to think about like, oh, we're going to get the X-Men out of this now. And like, we need to do, let's, let's, let's get some financial predictions for like how well we could do with the X-Men name behind our movies. And like, I don't know, looking ahead like that could be enjoyable, but at the same time, it eventually just devolves to crunching numbers and haggling and doing all kinds of stuff that I'm not sure that's why Bob Iger initially got into the business for. Now, on the other side of the coin, you have this other, this other Bob, the second Bob, heir to the Bob throne who recently served as the chairman of Disney parks experiences and products, as I mentioned. Now I would argue that the Disney parks are also doing very well. I I think they recently opened a park in Shanghai and of course, star Wars world is a big deal right now. So in that sense, it seems like a good move. I don't really know what the other choices were. Um, How many people would you say are qualified to become the CEO of again, the largest media company in the world? Well, the population Uh, already quickly gets narrowed down if your name's not Bob. So. Right, you have to be named Bob. That that's <laughs> criteria number one. After that, I guess I don't know. I guess they just looked internally and said, "Who's who's one of our guys that's really been tearing it up lately?" And they said, "Well, that Star Wars world is really getting us some good press." I I do wonder what the short list of of people was like if there even was one, or if this guy has been the heir apparent for like years. We have no idea. But well, I guess there's a lot of questions and a lot of things that happen behind closed doors that we'll never know. 
I think it'll just be interesting to see if the management style of Disney and like the direction of what they focus on will be different because I want to say Bob Iger actually came from like ABC. He worked on stuff like Home Improvement. I I I think that was one of the titles he worked on, but there were like a handful of shows that he worked on in the heyday of ABC before he came on to Disney. And so like, obviously he comes from like a really entertainment background in terms of like television and film whereas now new bob is coming from more of like the experiential entertainment so you have to kind of wonder like do you think they'll shift their focus i mean i think everything kind of goes hand in hand because you don't have the parks experience without the ip that drives it but it'll i mean it's just interesting to see where the focus will go and yeah it's, it's interesting to think now that maybe you know all these mergers and acquisitions might slow down and disney might stop expanding so much in terms of its media empire and like you said might focus more on the experiential element like looking at Iger's history i don't have anything from before he went to disney i imagine you're probably right about the home improvement thing I, i have a list here so this is actually really impressive so he launched and developed home improvement the drew carey show america's funniest home videos and who wants to be a millionaire Right. All all of those are all ABC properties. I know I know who who wants to be a millionaire and uh America's funniest home videos are. I believe so, yeah. That's just crazy and, though. Like I didn't have any idea. Like those are all super successful. Like who wants to be a millionaire was a cultural phenomenon. Well, and then he, you know, he came to Disney and became CEO and shortly into his tenure, they acquired Pixar. So like Oh, that's right. He yeah, said so, a lot so, of stuff. So that was essentially the start of a number of acquisitions that of course included star wars and marvel and everything but like that was a huge step for them too i mean look at toy story like it it almost defines at least a certain section of disney movies now it defines and an entire generation of people exactly and granted toy story one came out before that acquisition happened but you get the point that you know it seems like acquisitions might have been his focus at least in the creative sense of maybe he would watch certain things and say this is really great and we can afford to go out and get this and make it a Disney property. It is interesting to think where they might go next. You know, uh, are they looking to open more parks or are they looking to expand, you know, their merchandising? I have no idea, but I guess that's kind of what the move suggests. Yeah. I I don't know. I guess we'll see uh, in the coming months, but as it, as it states, as this article states, uh, Bob Iger will still be in the picture until 2021. I don't know how old he is. He doesn't look that old to me. So maybe he'll be around for longer than that. Wouldn't you want to retire early if you could? I Well, but you work on the was, happiest place on earth. He turned 69 this month. Nice. I think if I was Bob Iger, I would have retired, you know, 20 years ago. How? I mean. True. Yeah. If you're going to, if you want to retire early and you're Bob Iger, you would have done it a long time ago. He probably really likes doing what he does because like Tectic said, He's part of the happiest company. On, he's the head of the happiest company on earth. Either way, interesting times. We'll see where Disney goes with this. I don't think it's going to have too much of an effect on the massive machines that are Star Wars and Marvel, but maybe we'll see other smaller uh, changes to how things are done there. And I don't know. I mean, is that a welcome change at this point? Are you looking for Disney to change the way they do things? I, 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 I wonder a lot about what the connotation or what the public perception of Disney is these days. Do people see them as the boogeyman that I kind of described when I said they're just going around eating up companies or do they think that they do that because of how great they are? I mean, in a way, they kind of are. When you look at like they're a capitalist vulture, they eat up everybody. But at the same time, there is no other production company that consistently puts out the quality content that they do. Every time they acquire a brand, they like reinvigorate it and turn it around. And I know with Star Wars, there's question about whether people liked the movies the last three movies that came out but ultimately like star wars wasn't dying per se but it wasn't mainstream like it is now you go back like Uh, i don't know about that 10 years ago you think it was really like as mainstream as it is now little kids who never heard of star wars before have bb8s and are like super psyched about star wars again well i think the question is would lucasfilm have revived it had it not been for disney and i don't know the answer to that the answer could be no the answer could be yes for all i know they weren't even acquired at the time that they came out with force awakens but i mean at the oh, and during true, the times when the, i i did i don't i think it was very close together during the times that you know movies were coming out you know obviously back in the 70s and early 80s and then of course in you know the late 90s and the early 2000s like it was a huge deal i think it was a huge you know cultural icon and yeah maybe 
you know, I think episode seven, episode three came out in 2007 and maybe five years later, like you said, maybe people weren't really talking about it as much anymore, but it's always kind of going to be this cultural touchstone. Does Disney make that better or worse? I think it depends on who you ask and it, and it depends on how much they liked the, the sequel trilogy. I don't know the answer to that. Even being a huge Star Wars fan, I don't know how I feel about that, but I don't know. I don't think Disney's the boogeyman, but I understand why people think that they are the boogeyman. I think, you know, they're huge. And if they one day own everything, then they can control everything that we absorb in terms of like pop culture. And that's, I guess, a interesting, but also scary thing to think about. This is digressing. So I will let it digress no further and we will take our break. But before we do, I want to shout out our fantastic Patreon producer, Mr. Ben Checkness. You guys have been hearing about Ben a lot on the show if you're a regular listener because Ben has been supporting us on Patreon for quite a while now. At our highest of our three Patreon support levels, which is the night level, and as a result, Ben gets this producer shout out in every episode. He also gets input into our weekly game segment and, of course, access to the monthly secret segment and the monthly vlog. If you aren't as cool as Ben, that is understandable because Ben is very cool. You can then support us at our second level of support, which is the Squire level, which gives you access to the monthly secret segment and vlog. And there's also the Lowly Page level of support, which gets you access to the monthly secret segment. So if you like listening to us talk about things like Bob Iger and everything we've talked about over the years, uh, you can head on over to patreon.com slash online warriors podcast to get more of the details on how you could support this show. And we would super, super appreciate it. Also worth noting, uh, our good friend Ben will be joining us again on the show soon. That's again, part of his one of the benefits of his Patreon support. So uh, if you'd like to come on the show, there's your opportunity. With that food for thought, we will leave you with a short break to shout out some of our friends. Hi, I'm KC, host of the Sega Lounge, a show dedicated to all things Sega, be it the video games, the music, or the community. Join me every week for a new interview. My guests include video game industry legends, VGM remixers, and community standouts. You can catch every episode of the show at anchor.fm slash the Sega Lounge or search the Sega Lounge on your podcast service of choice. The Sega Lounge. Come on in and have a seat. We're back uh, to talk to you guys about Star Wars. No, we're not going to talk about how divisive the sequel trilogy is. We're going to be talking about the future of Star Wars, specifically what has been referred to as Project Luminous. Now, Project Luminous was teased last April, actually almost a year ago, at the 2019 Star Wars Celebration, which is this annual kind of big thing. I think it's in Chicago, although I don't remember exactly where it is. Maybe it changes location every year, where they basically just talk about all things Star Wars, things that are coming soon, things that are coming in the far future. Essentially, they announced what was called Project Luminous, and they announced a number of, I guess, authors. I'm going to say the names here. I don't know if I'm pronouncing them right. Once again, Kevin Scott, Claudia Gray, Justina Ireland, Daniel Jose Older and Charles Soule. Now, all of these people have written various things for Star Wars over the years, ranging from novels to comics uh, and the like. And basically, this announcement said they would all be involved in what was called Project Luminous, and it would begin launching in 2020, and no one really knew what it was. Uh, Until quite recently. Monday night, to be specific. uh, The curtain was pulled back uh, on what is essentially going to be kind of a uh, interconnected uh star wars story uh detailing what's called the high republic era of the jedi uh i believe it's like two yeah 200 years prior to the events of the phantom menace so if you've ever played knights of the old republic i think it's maybe close to that time period just think before episode one back when the jedi were presumably thriving um now i have read one novel from one of these people uh, had nothing to do with this. It was uh, actually kind of a precursor to the sequel trilogy by Claudia Gray called Lost Stars, I think. Uh, it was more of like a young adult kind of thing. But um, this is a super, super cool idea. So I don't know, generally opening up the room, thoughts on hearing more about the High Republic. The thing that I'm most excited for about it is that to me, it looks like they're taking literally everything that everyone ever might have thought, wow, you know, it'd be cool to see and they're doing it. So for me personally, one thing that I got super, super stoked about was like a real quick scene when I was kind of reading up on this, and it was an artist sketch 
of a Chewbacca with a lightsaber. And that, to me, was absolutely amazing. Not only do we get to see Jedi Chewie, well, not the Chewie, but you get the point, but we also kind of opens up the thing with, opens up the world to all of the other races that we're going to see wielding a lightsaber, which is awesome. I My favorite thing about Star Wars was the expansive universe and all the different races, and now we're getting them, giving them laser swords. Nice. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of concept art. I will say that. You mentioned concept art. One of the big components of this uh, quote unquote release that where they announced what this product actually was, was showing a lot of concept art, droids, creatures, Jedi, new races, you know, it, it's, it's a big deal. Um, but nerd bomber, I think I, I just cut you off. I was just gonna say, I really like how big of a world this seems to be. So from what I was seeing in the trailer, cause they released like probably it was like four minute overview of everything that this was. Um, it seems like it's going to be uh, a kind of like a Knights of the Round Table type cast where there's going to be like a, a group of main characters that you follow in all of the different stories. Because I think there's going to be, like you said, there's comic books, there's kids books, there's adult novels and all that kind of stuff. And you'll see characters throughout all of them kind of tying them together, but you'll also get brand new adventures. And they also said that they'll be exploring kind of like the new frontier of the world of Star Wars, because 200 years before The Phantom Menace, the Republic was fairly kind of like cordoned off. It had limits. So you'll be able to see then these new Jedi characters getting to explore the new frontier and seeing new enemies like the Nile, which they showed concept art sketches of in the trailer, which seemed like a really cool kind of badass crossover between, sorry for the swearing, um, the the Star Wars world and races and something like Mad Max. and. Yeah. This just all seems super awesome. It seems like a huge world to explore. There's going to be so much content. And even like the writer's room, they showed like a a snippet of what the writers were doing as they were trying to figure out what they wanted to do with the High Republic in general. And it just seems like you have a lot of different people from a lot of different backgrounds, like Tactic said, just kind of throwing different things at the wall. Like, what did you want to see from Star Wars? So we're going to get such varied stories. I think it's going to have a wide appeal to kids and adults alike. And it'll just be like a new generation of cool stuff to see with Star Wars. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the coolest things about Star Wars as as a fandom and just as kind of a fantasy is the extent of its world building. I mean, in theory, you have this infinite galaxy of, you know, I guess there's an outer rim and there's an inner rim, there's Coruscant, there's all these planets, but like there is in theory, like an infinite amount of world building that you can build onto the existing world building. It's, it's kind of this engine that can just run forever. Right. And, you know, we've heard about all these movies that are in development and now we're hearing about this big project of interconnected stories. And one of the first things that people are asking is, okay, we see these book covers, which are gorgeous. We see these comics, we see these concept art, you know, but are we going to get a video game? Are we going to get a movie? And, and, you know, there there are reportedly rumors from EA that uh, there's a video game in the works that like either reboots or kind of um, tries to capture the essence of like Knights of the Old Republic, which I mentioned. Um, And as, as I mentioned as well, how many movies are in development that we don't even know anything about with Star Wars. So there could be even more uh, tying into this. And it's super, super exciting, you know, just imagine how much of this period of time is relatively unharvested in terms of like the Star Wars extended universe, which, you know, when the sequel trilogy was announced, a lot of canon was decanonized, but now we're, we're kind of building that back up again. It's so, super, super exciting. I have a question for you because I know you were really big into reading the Star Wars novelizations. What is the quality that you think we should be expecting? Like, Obviously, you said you already have familiarity with one of the writers, but what kind of quality in terms of just like novels should we expect from these Star Wars novels? Well, I, so I, I don't want to crap on one of the authors in this project. Uh, the Claudia Gray novel that I read, I, I think it was good. I don't think it was geared to me. I think at the time I read it, I was I was too old for it. It was very it was going for like a Twilight thing is what it was going for. It was very young adulty. And I think I read it primarily because I was so excited about the new movies that were coming out. And I just wanted to get more Star Wars in my life. Back when I was like middle school, high school age, I was reading the New Jedi Order books, where this, which were this very long series by a number of different authors um, that took place after the events of Return of the Jedi. So at this point, obviously those aren't canon anymore, but they involved uh, essentially an invasion of an alien race from 
beyond the farthest reaches of the galaxy. And it was incredible. It was super, super compelling, super, super rich with detail, new characters, interacting with old characters. It was amazing. It was honestly everything that the sequel trilogies tried to be cranked up to 11 and it was just fantastic uh i also read uh some novels from the x-wing series which were a little bit more fighter piloty but they were still super super interesting and then even you know existing within the uh the movie universe there were a lot of great novelizations by timothy zahn um that focused on kind of the interim between the movies like between new hope and uh, empire strikes back and between empire strikes back and return of the jedi that were really really fantastic i think the capability to create legitimately great stories uh within this world the capability is there and if these authors can harness that um you know i think we're in for a a lot of uh super super awesome novels i don't know like how these how the novels they've done before have been reviewed um all i know is that it's certainly possible to make something great Another great thing that was touched upon, too, is when they were going through kind of the concept art and um, how kind of all the characters would look like, they actually recruited the original concept artist who designed Darth Maul. And in my opinion, Darth Maul is the badassest looking villain ever. And to kind of pull the brain of that guy for inspiration, that is a perfect choice for this project. I, I think the phrase you might have been looking for was pick the brain. <laughs> I don't know if anyone's brain has ever been pulled. I can't imagine it'd be pleasant either way. Yeah, there's a reason Darth Maul has come back. There's a reason he's come back in the Clone Wars. There's a reason that he, kind of spoilers, had, came back at the end of uh, Solo. It's because he is one of the coolest characters ever, at least visually speaking. Like, he is so evil, and he is the next best thing to evil from Darth Vader. I mean, he's even, um, he's even, they've even brought him back in the animated series. Like all of a sudden yeah. he's alive now. Exactly. They just, and he's got robotic legs, you know, to have a villain that notorious and to build off of the brainchild or brain parent, that is a good choice. Well, something, and this is a bit of a, of a sidebar, but I was watching a video yesterday on this website called YouTube. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. And it was about um, how iconic Darth Vader is and why he's so iconic and why visually he is just so evocative of evil. And when you look at a silhouette of Darth Vader without even seeing his features, you know that it's Darth Vader and, and you feel certain things. And the crazy thing about Darth Vader is that in the first three movies that he's featured in, there's probably, what, six and a half, something close to six and a half hours of runtime. And how much of that time do you think Darth Vader is on screen? Is this Price is Right rules? I'm going to go an hour. Okay. We'll say Price is Right rules, yeah. I'm going to say, I feel like only half an hour of all the screen time put together. Yeah, it's just under 34 minutes, which blew my mind. I mean, he's this, again, like cultural icon. He's this character that looms so large for so many people as this like basically embodiment of evil. And he was like, barely on screen for each of these movies i mean if you divide that up it's like 10 minutes for each movie it's nothing and yet he's this huge deal and like darth maul it's kind of a similar thing right granted he was only in one movie but he was in that movie for gosh had to be 10 minutes so it's probably super interesting to and it's super challenging to develop a character visually speaking that sticks in the minds of people and again evokes these certain feelings and it's great that they got the guy to come back and provide some more of his uh, creativity i'm excited for this um depending on how these novels are received this is something that i might actually get involved in because as, as i mentioned the star wars novels back when i was reading those back when i was a kid uh that was a really great time so if they can recapture that here in a newer era could be a huge deal for them so I agree. Check I'm out. very pumped. Project Luminous. Um, I actually don't have in front of me when the first novels are slated to come out. Um, it seems like it should be fairly soon. Uh, August is what I'm seeing. Just before Star Wars Celebration 2020. So be on the lookout for that. Um, let's move into what we've been up to. And let's start this week with uh, Nerd Bomber. Ladies first. 
All right, so I'm trying to dive back into fitness. As you guys know, I was out two weeks ago because I was sick, and I, I was actually, I had a good routine going before that, and then I got sick, and for the last two weeks, I just was not doing anything, and I needed something new to get me re-motivated. So I tried a few apps because I'm always curious about the latest technology because a lot of these apps you see, like they track your movement and there's AI. And so I tried two. One was Freeletics, which I tried. Uh, they get, had like a 14-day trial where you could get your money back. And there was like no weights involved. It was all like body weight movements. And that one I didn't really like that much because I have a lower back issue. So there were just a lot of exercises that I struggled with and I can actually feel like my back's a little bit sore this week after doing them and there was no option to swap it out. So I did not like that one as much, but I'm sure for able-bodied people, it's probably fine. But I did find a different app called FitBod and the neat thing about this is it's a very AI-driven app. So it actually shows you on like a, a mannequin thing in the app all of the different muscle groups and then based on the workouts which you can tailor to like if you have certain equipment at your house or your gym you have different profiles you can set up for the equipment that you have available and then you can put like different exercises on the no-no list so anything basically involving things that would tweak my lower back that I know I can't do I was able to just completely take out And the cool thing is that it automatically then generates an ideal quote unquote workout for you down to the number of reps you should do and the number or like the the size of the weights you should be using. And it, it can do things like resistant bands, dumbbells, and even like machines at the gym. You just have to put in what's available to you. And the cool thing is then after you do a workout, you can pull up like the body list and it'll actually show you which muscles are tired. It'll give you like a percentage of their recovery and it won't target those muscles until they hit a certain recovery rate. So basically the entire thing is just very smartly programmed and designed so you're not overworking yourself and then it progresses with you. So like, I mean, obviously I've only been using it for a week, but say I've been using this for six months, then it would progress and give me different reps or different exercises to help me with whatever fitness progress I want. And you can put in like what your goal is. Like you can be an Olympic weightlifter, I guess. I did not select that. I just wanted like overall fitness, but it's a pretty neat app. It's it's kind of pricey. It's like nine ninety nine a month. So I don't know how long I'll use it. But I think just to get me back in the routine of doing stuff and kind of switching things up so I'm not bored, I think it, it's kind of neat. Is it actually called the no no list? You mentioned the no no list at one point. No, oh, it's funny. excluded. It's like excluded exercises. But in my head, because when I went to physical therapy, my physical therapist called it like, here is your no no list of stuff you should not do. Or you'll <laughs> hurt yourself again. So like in my head, it's just like, oh, I have a no no list. I can't do that. <laughs> Wow. Well, it sounds like something that I would be interested in, interested in, in that I tend to do a lot of more, a lot more home workouts now than I used to. Um, I find it hard to get to the gym. Like the physical act of transporting myself there is surprisingly tedious and annoying. So I try to just like find home workouts to do without any weights. And it's pretty easy, you know, I mean, there's a lot of ways to use your own body weight. But it's also pretty easy to run out of out of ideas there. So it sounds like something I could benefit from. Yeah, it's definitely got a lot of cool stuff, a lot of alternatives to typical exercises to keep things mixed up. They do have, I think, a three workout trial. So you could, in theory, just go generate like three workouts and take a screenshot and keep them. But That's support cheating. your indie app developers. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to be that guy. Um, cool. Right on. Go fitness. Um we here at the Online Warriors are, are in favor of all y'all feeling great about yourselves. I don't know. I don't know where I was going with that. Tactic, what do you have? So the most notable thing for me in this past week was we watched the movie Fighting With My Family. And this movie is basically the backstory of a famous wrestler for the WWE, Paige, and how she kind of grew up and got to where she is today. And... It was another one of those, hey, the rocks in this movie of the billions of movie he turns out a year. So I, I kind of wasn't expecting much from this movie. I thought it was going to be a dud just because he turns out so many movies. One of them's got to be bad. And I have to tell you, I was quite impressed with this movie. And that's saying a lot because I'm not a big WWE fan. So I do recommend this movie. It's It's got a bunch of family-friendly feels and it's got a good amount of comedy in it but it also it makes you want to be like determined 
and try out for the WWE, as weird as that sounds. Are you planning on doing that? No, not not. I, I was for like six minutes after the movie, but that faded. Yeah, I would say the cool thing, the cool thing about this movie is like, I'm not a big WWE fan at all, but I was still super entertained. And like Tactic said, it was more of a story about her journey and it was kind of inspirational. And so even if you didn't care about wrestling whatsoever, you still kind of found yourself drawn in. And it was also kind of empowering because the the thing about this real person, um, I'm going to use her stage name again, Paige is that she was kind of the the stepping stone to get more women into wrestling and and start this female driven revolution in the sport. So it's not only was a family friendly movie but it was kind of an inspiration to to young girls who who are who are into it and think it's something cool. Well there you have it, fighting with my family. Uh did you like stream that somewhere or like disc rental or what was the situation there? We streamed it on Amazon Prime. Well, there you have it. Uh, I have an Amazon Prime update as well. Um, so Hayes and I have been watching this show called Undone. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. Um, it's it's hard to explain, but it's fantastic so far. Um, we actually had an uh, we had an evening last week where we were kind of trolling, looking for new shows, and this is worthy of an entire episode. But we tried Fleabag and just could not do it. Like I don't know why that show is so people love it so much it was hard to watch so we turned it off after five minutes now we went to this show called undone which i had heard briefly about um mostly because it uses rotoscoping animation um basically it's those things you see that they're animated but they're clearly based on live actors uh they basically they film something and then they kind of like it's a technique that involves animating over it it's hard to explain unless you see it but once you see it you'll know exactly what i'm talking about um it's fantastic it has it's a show that has a lot of big ideas um the plot involves a girl learning she can time travel um through the ghost of her dead father who then tries to get her to go back and determine who killed him um not a lot of notable names bob odenkirk is the only really big one another Uh, bob another bob but uh it's fantastic the only other update that i have which is a tragic one is that i'm still playing through metroid prime 2 echoes um my GameCube controller is starting to starting to go. And by oh, that, no. I mean... So, here, so here's the thing, is when you're a kid and you're holding a GameCube controller and you're like really... You want to like get places fast, right? So you're pushing forward on the control stick. I Maybe my hands are stronger now that I'm, an, I'm presumably an adult. But like the controller... You know, you know what happens to control sticks when you push them too hard? You know how they get all wobbly? Mm-hmm. You, guys know, you guys know what I'm talking about. Anyways, that's happening. So I'm going to have to think about replacing my GameCube controller, which um, will probably be a worthwhile investment just so I can continue cranking through Metroid Prime 2, which I'm about halfway through, but um, the going is, is getting slower because it, it I can only move forward very slowly now. Get one of the old modded controllers with the turbo button. I'm, I'm figuring out, I, I don't know if, I, if it's super important to me that I get a wireless one or if I get an official one. I don't know. I'm kind of in the shopping process for that, but I will keep you all updated. Um, as far as the fantasy movie league goes, uh, I'm on a roll with setting my lineup, which is good. It's not, it's not working out, but I'm setting my lineup consistently. Uh, congrats to Ben Checkness, our good friend who we've already mentioned. Uh, first place this week was 67 million, uh, followed by Devin Reed, who's, who's, uh, a perennial powerhouse just short of, of Ben's number. Also right around 67, uh, Mecca Yoda at 56. Tactic, our very own Tactic, at 43, and then I'm at 42. Florida Hawk is at 41, and Nerd Bomber, also at 41. Um, Rounding out the top 10, we have Hipster Pop Geek with 37, Spitfire with 30, well, 29, and (laughs) Secret Asian Man, always number 10, uh, with just about 9 million. So looking at the overall leaderboard for this season, which is entering its final two weeks, Hipster Pop Geek still on top with 729 million um florida hawk uh at number two with 66 no i think i might have said the first number wrong let me go through it again hipster pop geek with 730 million uh florida hawk with 658 million nerd bomber third place with 654 55 million devin reed with 616 million Tectic rounding out the top five with 613 million that one week really set me back 
Yeah, you you were you were in second for a long time, weren't you? And now you've, you've yeah. you're down at number five. Um, it looks like we have some close races here. Uh, Nerd Bomber and Florida Hawk fighting for second. There's only a couple million difference between them. Uh, Devin Reed and Tactic fighting for that fourth place spot. Other than that, uh, Hipster Pop Geek running away with it. But if you want to challenge Hipster Pop Geek in our next season, you can. Uh, learn the ropes here at the end of this of this season by heading on over to fantasymovieleague.com uh, looking up the league online warriors podcast and the password to get into it is podcast all overcase we would love to have you join us tactic you have a game for us is that correct i do and i'm particularly excited about this game it is cat themed so i would just like to point out we are in season nine now of this podcast and cats have nine lives we're in Ayo. season nine of this podcast. Oh yeah, nine point one, baby. Time flies when you're having fun. This is the first episode of, of season nine. Yes, sir. Wow, jeez, I didn't even know it until we're near the end of the episode. Well, welcome to season nine, guys. It's great to be here. Yeah, all of the quiz topic options that I gave our Patreon subscribers had to do with number nine. So, what were the uh, what was left on the cutting room floor? Uh, there was Brooklyn Nine Nine was one, and then I mm. forgot what the other one was cats well obviously cats and I then a third one which which shall remain nameless all right so tactic you're going to be quizzing us about cats i will be so i'm going to start it off with domestic cat themed questions and then it and then it'll open the floor to all cats big and small okay wow okay so for the first question domestic cats have been tracked for indoor and outdoor cats and have been found to travel on average about four acres around there, around one location. The same experiment was done with feral cats. How many acres on average did they travel? Okay. Um, do I go first? Who goes first? You decide. I'm going to say dealer's choice, or I'm the dealer. I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to say ladies first. Okay. Okay, I do have a question. Are we talking, is this one day or in general? Like, this is in general. They kind of mosey around some home location. Okay, I'm going to say, I'm going to go big here. I'm going to say 15 acres. I feel like kitties like to wander. I honestly, but the thing is, like, I have no idea. Like, feral cats, well, I guess they don't have a home, but, like, they're feral, right? So they're always, like, protecting something, I feel like. I almost, part of me almost wants to say less, but I'm I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with eight because it feels right. Okay, you're both way off. It's astronomical. One thousand three hundred and fifty-one acres. No way. Yeah, as what, opposed what, to what, four. <laughs> I guess I just don't know what an acre looks like. <laughs> like, is that that must just be like how far they travel in their lifetimes, right? Yeah, that's still a lot. Okay, I probably haven't even gone that many acres. So I, I technically, I won that one though, right? Yes. Oh did. yeah, you won. Oh yeah. So now this, now we're open up to all cats. And the question is, how many species of cat are there? Oh, um, okay. Oh, I feel like this should be easy. I, you know, I'm going to say 42. I feel like there's got to be more than that. I'm going to say 200 at least. So you both busted. The answer was 36. What? Oh, God, come on. Dang it. To but ha- there's I so can't, many can't different kitty You were a multiple of six, so that was pretty good. I was, re- I was right in there, man. At least I didn't say 200. But still, no points for me, so I'm, I'm still losing. 36, huh? Yeah. Okay, next question. Nerd Bomber's got it so far. The world's smallest cat is known as the Rusty Spotted Cat. Side note, it is the cutest cat I have ever seen. I have sent it to everyone here, and they concur. How much does it weigh? And there's actually a number of acceptable answers because it's a range. Is it... What units? What's the units? Pounds. I I don't know. Okay. Nerd Bomber, you're first on this one. I'm going to say this little guy goes for three pounds. Oh, it's less than that. This thing, this thing is, this thing's one pound. Come on. It's so small. Okay, so Nerd Bomber gets it. 
The answer was 1.8 to 3.5 pounds. Oh, come. <sighs> Stupid range. All right. Well, I was All right, close. So right. Let's catch it on the flip side. The largest cat in the world is actually a hybrid. You can't naturally get this large without start mixing stuff and making it weird. And that is a liger. Oh, like in Napoleon Dynamite. Yeah, Napoleon Dynamite was on to something. It's when you what you get when you mix a male tiger and a female lion. Okay, this thing is... You're, so what, you're asking in pounds, right? So what is the weight of the heaviest liger? And is this an exact number? Or is it also a range? It is an exact number. <sighs> this is a big boy. I'll tell you that right now. Or is it a girl? I don't know. I, it, this is... Guys, this is 375 pounds. This is a this is a big mama. I'm going to say maybe even more than that because this thing probably is packed with muscle. Like, have you seen lions and tigers? They're just like lean, mean, kitty machines. Uh, I'm going to go 500 pounds. So tigers cap out at around 600 pounds. Oh, God. <laughs> lions cap out around 500 pounds. This... This liger weighed 1,600 pounds. No way. Where did that even come from? It's like a car. It came, I, I said it. It came from a lion and a tiger. I understand, but the, its parents don't even weigh that much. How does that work? I don't know. I don't understand genetics. Help. I'm picturing I'm picturing Jabba the Hutt just like laying somewhere like a slug. This is big giant cat. And everyone's feeding it stuff being like, we have to make you the heaviest cat ever. So we have this record. So, so uh, far you have to get everything right now. Illegal. Yeah, what is what is it? Three nothing now. I'm really blowing it. What else is new? Yep. Okay, so a cheetah is the fastest cat in the world. How fast can it reach in three seconds? In, uh, well, actually, I don't go first. So, Nerd Bomber, you you go ahead. <laughs> I want to say it's comparable to like a fancy sports car. I feel like I've seen that in a physics textbook somewhere. That it can go like zero to 60 in three seconds. So I'm going to go 60. I think it's slightly higher. I actually recently heard the number, the top speed that it can reach. I don't know if it reaches that in three seconds, but it was like 70. So I'm going to say 68. That was good. 69.5. Oh nice. my goodness. So All right. Illegal that was close. takes the point. You almost said 70. I was sweating. <laughs> that would have been horrible. All right, sweet. I'm, okay. I'm on the board. So we got the fastest. Now how about the strongest? Jaguars have the strongest bite force. How many pounds of force can a jaguar exhibit? Oh, yeah. See, I have no point of reference for that. I don't even know how hard I bite. Like, if I bit down on a scale, what would the dumper say? I don't I know, but I know you can bite off the tip of your finger like it's a carrot. Mm. I do know that. Um but that wouldn't take very many pounds of force. My my finger is is, is weak. I'm going to say it's going to be some enormous number. I mean, we just heard about a cat that weighed 1,600 pounds. I'm going to say 2,000. Nerd bomber? I legitimately have no idea, so I'm going to say 800 pounds. It's the, har- it's the hardest one yet. Okay, so... Illegal hits the nail on the head. 2,000 on the nose. Get out of here. Man, you don't come, like, you don't mess around. So, okay, so now I could tie it. That's where we are. What a comeback. Let's see what happens. Okay. Also, people are going to think that I, che- I am cheating, and you guys have no way of proving that I'm not because you're not, we're not in the same room, but I promise you, I take this way too seriously to cheat. Okay, so. Okay, okay. <laughs> cougars can jump the highest of all of the animal kingdoms how high is that um oh wait i don't go first i have i so i didn't hear the animal name cougar cougars not to be confused with a middle-aged woman going after young men okay so these guys have to be able to like leap into trees how tall is a tree uh why do they why do they have to be why do they have to leap into trees? <laughs> I don't know. You always you always hear about cougars in the woods or the jungle or whatever, and they're leaping from trees, so they must leap into trees, right? I don't want to interrupt your thought process. You just do what you're doing. So they're leaping into trees, 
And if you're in the jungle, it's got to be kind of a tall tree, maybe like probably 30 feet. Question mark. Boy, I think that's, I don't, I don't, I'm still not sure about how you got to that answer, but that's, I feels like a really good answer. I tried to think um, about how tall a tree might be. I, again, I'm just like, how high can humans jump? I think you're probably really, really close. I can't, I'm just deciding if I should go a little bit under or a little bit over. I'm going to say 15 feet. So, I'm going to pause for dramatic effect. Please. Illegal ties it up. No way. Oh, my goodness. The answer is 18 feet. We got ourselves an intense battle. Okay, so I don't know how big trees are, apparently. But first... I I, I think you don't know that they, for sure... I don't know. I still they don't, don't know bound they a tree in a single leap. They're not <laughs> Superman. <laughs> they probably do. They probably just like grasp on and then they claw their way up. But can I just say, so we have a the fastest cheetah at 69 miles per hour. Nice. You have a bite force of 2,000 pounds and you have a jump height of 18 feet. A com- combination of these things is terrifying. Yo, kitties are like the perfect killing machines. They really yeah. are. This is a documented fact. Like, the only reason they don't kill us is because we feed them, you know? And they Even love like us. house cats. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> that's, that's subject to the cat, I think. So you have to find a tiebreaker question now, right? I mean, you can't leave it like this. Okay, and I've got one. Great. So, this is a little factoid. A cat has the power to sometimes heal themselves by purring. What? A domestic yeah. cat's purr has a frequency between 25 to blank hurts wait hold on hold up hold up they can heal themselves by purring don't even act like you've never healed yourselves by purring this is like mind this frequency is the frequency at which muscle and bones best grow and repair themselves hashtag wolverine 25 to blank hurts what is the max frequency of this range Okay, I go first, um, and we're t- we're playing bust rules here, of course. Yes, <sighs> I'm gonna say ninety. Ninety. Nerd bomber. Okay, so I think that's too high. So I'm gonna say twenty six. So illegal takes it home. These cats are straight up motorboating because they're maxing out <laughs> at a hundred. I don't think they're motor and fifty hertz. <laughs> Just. I was deciding between 60 and 120, and I split the difference. Nerd Bomber, you said 25 to 26? Well... That was a very interesting Well, because then I couldn't it's bust. It's a super tight range. No, because then I couldn't bust. Oh, okay. I see. So, so you just I thought the mine it, was higher. Yeah. Yeah. So I was trying to not bust. It's really just good strategy. Unfortunately... You uh, should have went with the plus one rule. Guys, can we just, first of all, talk about the fact that cats can cure themselves? Yeah, they're basically Wolverine killing machines. Also, basically Wolverine. Why has nobody taken that technology somehow and like made a purr machine for humans? Like, have I a think, broken bone, just purr a little bit. I think you're you're glossing over the main takeaway from this experience, which is that I came back down down three to nothing. That's true. I <laughs> failed in spectacular fashion. Cat healing, whatever. The comeback of the century on online warriors podcast. People are going to be talking about this for years people are gonna be talking about this till season 20 Dang. i can't wait till we get to season 20 we're, co- we're coming up on double digits we should have some kind of celebration for double digits we should like we a, should have a cake yeah D- a there double layer cake, cake. <gasps> perfect and every every time we get when we get to triple digits when we're like in our 60s <laughs> i don't know when that'll be uh we'll add a, a, another layer to the cake perfect perfect plan um perfect plan and yeah, like Marie Antoinette said, let them eat cake. Uh, so that was a cat joke. You missed it. It's fine. Oh, I, oh, I missed it. I just thought you said it was a perfect plan. Like it was, is because it is. It's perfect. Uh, Probably didn't pick it up because I was purring at 150 hertz. Yeah, my if my ear can't can't hear that much. Um, my ear can't hear much of anything. But uh, yeah, season ten's around the corner. Season nine has begun, and we thank you all for joining us and listening. Uh, and. We will see you next week. In the meantime, if you like what you've listened to, you can head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a review, or you can hit us up on the social meds. Uh, I am at 
OW Illegal 86. We have at OW Nerd Bomber and at OW Tactic. Yep. Check us out. Um, also, there's a main show account at Online Warriors 1. Don't want to forget that one. So uh, go hit us up. Uh, and in the meantime, we will talk at you all next week. Have a good week.